Well, as we've already heard this morning, today is our second Sunday in the season of Advent, and uh, we begin a series of uh, sermons looking at our Lord Jesus and how the Psalms speak of his coming to live among us. And today we're going to look at Psalm 16, a psalm of David. He wrote this poem or song roughly a thousand years before Christ came. A long time to wait. A good question to ask ourselves as we read or hear the word of the Old Testament is how does this point to or speak about Jesus? How do these words help us to understand who Jesus is and why he came? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for its truth. We thank you that we can rely on it and that through it we know you. Father, you have been good to us by providing knowledge of yourself in your word. Thank you, Lord. Help us today as we look at it. Help us to understand. And please, Lord, speak to us, to our hearts, to our minds, and change us by the power of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So Psalm 16, it's on page 478 of your pew Bibles. A miktam of David. I could not find out what a miktam means. There were a number of opinions, none of which seemed to agree. Protect me, God, for I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have nothing good besides you. As for the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones. All my delight is in them. The sorrows of those who take another God for themselves will multiply. I will not pour out their drink offerings of blood. I will not speak their names with my lips. Lord, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I will bless the Lord who counsels me, even at night when my thoughts trouble me. I always let the Lord guide me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, my whole being rejoices, and my body also rests securely. For you will not abandon me to Sheol, You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. You reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. Does anyone remember what took place on the 11th of March 2011? There was a little earthquake offshore in Japan. Over 20,000 people died because of that earthquake. Caused a series of tidal waves to come ashore in Japan. And many of you would have seen footage of them. There's plenty about showing the power and destruction of those waves. There's one particular footage that took my notice in particular. It shows a harbour full of ships of various sizes and it looks like a perfectly sheltered harbour, safe from hurricanes, a good place to keep your boat. It has a good, solid-looking breakwater that runs parallel to the shore and there's only a little entrance into the harbour. And in the background, you can hear a siren blaring. I assume it's the warning of the tidal wave coming. And right at the top of the video, you can just see a little ship heading out to sea, fast as it can go, heading away from the safe harbour. And then you see the tidal surge arrive. 
when you see the destruction, devastation, and the breakwater wall, the water just goes clean over it. Those ships thought they were in a safe harbour. It had been safe plenty of times before. Never before had they seen this danger. Never before had they seen the water come over the break wall. It was a refuge in a storm, but not in a tidal wave. That's the funny thing about lots of refuges. They're often specific to a particular danger. I troubled me by what escape. Many ships and boats in Japan found that a safe harbour from a storm was not a safe place in a tidal wave. In fact, it was a dangerous place. A safe cave in the snow where you might find warmth might contain a bear. A safe tree above floodwater might contain a snake. In some places in the world, safe, fresh drinking water might contain a crocodile. We all have our refuges, don't we? Places or things that we do or where we go that protect us from danger, worries, concerns. Where's your place of refuge? Where do you feel safe and secure? Protected? When do you feel at peace? Over and over again in the book of Psalms, God is described as a refuge. David wrote many of those Psalms. We're going to look at one of them today. And David begins in this Psalm, Protect me, God. I take refuge in you. It's a request for protection to a God who David says is already his refuge. If he was a ship, he sailed into a safe harbour. That is the almighty God. And now he seeks his protection. It's almost like the appeal of an asylum seeker. Here I am in your safe land. Please take me in, protect me. But what it is, is an expression of trust in God. Like a child asking a father, You're my refuge. Please protect me. God, you are where I feel safe. You are where I feel secure. Please protect me. David turns to the God who he knows and trusts in for refuge again. What prompts this question is hard to say. But God is where David turns when he feels threatened or overwhelmed by the world. One thing is clear, David doesn't turn timidly to God, he turns confidently. And his confidence is based on his knowledge of who God is and what God has done in the past. Now you can see that throughout the psalm, David recognising over and over again who God is. We've already heard David identify God as his refuge, Let me read in verse 2. I said to the Lord, You are my Lord. I have nothing good besides you. With those words and throughout the psalm, we get the sense that David values God above everything else. God is not just far off. God is also active and personal. In verses 3 and 4, we find that David's appetites have been transformed. He now finds delight in those who truly belong to God, God's people. He enjoys their company. He enjoys seeing the lives they live in response to being God's people. But he finds that he cannot participate anymore, if he ever could, in the activities of those who have taken a different God for themselves. And he can see that their activities only increase their sorrows. He does not even want to name them. 
In verse 5, we find that David sees God as his personal portion, like a full meal, a portion that satisfies his cup of blessing. We get the sense that God is completely adequate, totally satisfying. We meet the God who holds David's future. In verse 6, we meet the God who has laid down boundary lines for the life of his people. And those boundary lines lie in pleasant places. The law of God is good, guiding the lives of his people. These are blessings from God that are experienced now. But David recognises future blessings to come as well. David knows he has a beautiful inheritance which God will provide. In verse 7, we meet the Lord who gives David sound counsel, even at night when his thoughts trouble him. God provides the people that David delights in. God is the all-satisfying portion. God draws the boundary lines for life that are a pleasure to abide by. God provides a beautiful inheritance. God provides good counsel when David has troubling thoughts. God is at David's right hand to guide him and help him not to be shaken. Is it any wonder? He finds God to be of greater worth than anything and everything else. God's past, his present and his future care leave a lead David to rely on him, depend on him, to enjoy him, to be glad in him, and to rest. To truly rest in him. Secure. Safe. And what is David's response? In verse 9 we read, Therefore my heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My body rests securely. Joy, gladness, security. And it permeates every part of David. His heart, his body, his whole being. Is that us? Is that how you find God's people around you to be? Are we a people of glad hearts who rejoice in all our being, in who God is, and whose bodies rest securely in who God is? That's David's experience of God. God can be trusted in every circumstance, at all times. And that is why he can be glad, rejoice and be secure. A non-Christian man said to me yesterday, he's roughly my age, how he was sick of all the negativity in the world. Is that your experience? I can barely watch the news. What a backdrop of good news we have about our Lord. What a, what a backdrop, sorry, to put the good news of our Lord against all that negativity. And there seems to be lots of worry and despair, doesn't there? But are we, as God's people, any different to the world? And do we bring good news into that negative world? So if God is so much to David, what? and if he is so secure, why the question in verse 1? It troubles me. Why ask again? 
for God's protection. When we're in danger, we all go somewhere where we've been safe in the past. That dependability factor, if you like. Been safe before, I'll be safe there again. As I said before, it's the past, present and future reliability of God's goodness that leads David to again turn to him. God is his refuge, has been in the past, is now, will be in the future. And David hasn't been disappointed. Why is he called out again? Protect me, God. Why does he feel that need? He's firmly anchored in the harbour. He's always found to be safe in the past. He's enjoying rest and there in its security. But I suggest David now turns his mind to a greater danger, a solid, real danger we all have to face. The total reality of death. It's in verse 10 that we find that danger and David's thoughts on it. In verse 10 we read, You will not abandon me to Sheol. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. It's a simple statement, isn't it? He's trusting God to protect him even in death. Now, what experience in David's life could lead him to the point of trusting that God will keep him safe, even in death? David's a soldier. He's seen plenty of death. He's seen how fragile life is. And he's probably ended, well, we know he ended at least one life. He's probably ended plenty of lives himself. And he's probably seen plenty of decay. What could lead him to make the leap to thinking that God will keep him secure, even in death? I suggest God's word leads David to feel secure, even in that. Sheol, in verse 10, is the place of death. Some translations use hell, some the grave. It's the place where the dead end up. Also in verse 10, an alternative translation of the word decay is corruption. Corruption or decay, the physical consequence of dying. Whichever way you translate it, the same word is also used as the consequence, one of the consequences of sin. Sin results in decay or corruption. It may be physical or spiritual decay. So the link back to Genesis 3 and God's judgment of the actions of Adam and Eve is obvious. Sin results in death, going to Sheol, and the decay and and corruption. That's the reality we all face. And here is our greatest problem. David states simply, in the face of that reality, God will not abandon me to Sheol. He will not let his faithful one see decay. David is confident in God as a safe refuge, even from sin and its consequences. In Deuteronomy 30, there is a passage that contrasts the way of life and the way of death. I'll just read a few verses. See, today I have set before you life and prosperity, death and adversity. For I am commanding you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commands, statutes and ordinances 
so that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God may bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not listen and you are led astray to bow in worship to other gods and serve them, I tell you today that you will certainly perish and will not prolong your days in the land you are entering to possess across the Jordan. The contrast is stark, isn't it? Life, death. And God's talking about his, the commands he's given his people, the Ten Commandments. Here are the boundary lines that God has given his people, the pleasant boundary lines that David calls them. And as we'll see, here are the paths of life that David mentions in a couple of verses. Now, do we see God's commandments lie in just the right place? Or do we see them as an imposition, a restriction on our freedom? Do we delight in the law of the Lord? David is trusting God. David is delighting in God and in his commandments. He is certain God will not abandon him to Sheol. David knows the path of life because God has revealed it to him. We see it in verse 11. We, you reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy at your right hand are eternal pleasures. But David isn't the faithful one, is he? He dies, he's buried, his body decays. In his sermon at Pentecost, which we heard read earlier, earlier on, Peter interprets these verses. And Peter makes a clear distinction between David and Christ. David dies buried. His tomb is there in Jerusalem for people to go and visit. But Peter tells us that David was a prophet and he was guided by the Spirit when he writes in the Psalms of the Christ to come. And he writes of the one who will not sin, who will be the faithful one. And in his writing about life and death, David writes of the resurrection of Jesus. And he writes truthfully, he will not be abandoned to the grave. His body will not be see decay. He will be raised to life. And he will be exalted by the Father, who will give him the seat of honour at his own right hand. Now, in his mercy, God has given us proof that David didn't have. He's given us proof that death has been defeated. Christ was born a man. He lived a sinless life. He is the perfectly faithful one that does not sin. So that chain of descent of sin is broken. Christ does not deserve to suffer the consequences of God's judgment in Genesis 3. And yet, and yet, God chooses to impose on him all we deserve. And in it, he reveals his vast mercy for you and I. The wrath that we deserve is on him. We know that well, don't we? I even saw some people switch off when I started to talk about it. We know it so well and we take it for granted. 
We don't feel the weight of it. The eternal consequences of it. And I've slowed down intentionally to let that weight settle on us for a bit. As it should. But the good news is the judgment of God against our sin has been satisfied. I'll say that again. The judgment of God against our sin has been satisfied. The crowds at Pentecost were cut to the heart and many believed. The question for us is, do we believe? Do you believe for yourself? Not because you're here in church with a bunch of people who believe. Not because you're a child of someone who believes. Do you believe Jesus died for your sins and was raised to life? Do you believe he was born a man, God born a man? Do you believe he died an awful death for your sins? Believing these things fully, completely, brings the only security against death. Death and its power over us is broken. So many people worry about death. It takes away their security, their joy and their rest. But Christ defeated it. He rose from the dead, proof of his victory over sin and its consequences. And those who are his, will rise to be with him. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The positive way of saying is that, as is that all who come by Jesus will come to the Father. Jesus is the entrance to the safe refuge, the harbour which stands safe against the one thing we all will face, death. This psalm, above all else, is a positive psalm, full of security, pleasure, rejoicing in what our Lord has done. As far as we know, David did not know fully what God would do. We are so blessed. We have Jesus, we have God's word recording our Lord's coming, living and dying, and we have positive proof of the defeat of death. Do we live like that's true? Really? I pray that this psalm, it's a song of joy really. I pray that this song of joy can be yours. That you too can say, my heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My body rests securely. For you, my Lord, will not abandon me to Sheol. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. You reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. Amen. Amen.